away. Here's a look at how we are being the church this week. This month's Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Focus is Kids Clothes. Please bring new kids' clothes of all sizes to the display in the foyer anytime this month. They will be gathered at the end of the month and stored with other shoebox items to be packed in November. On July 4th, we will have one service in the sanctuary at 10 a.m. There will be no groups that day except for those kids ages 4 and under. Join us for a sweet time of joint worship together on July 4th. This year's Vacation Bible School will take the form of a one-day VBS Blitz. It will happen on Sunday, July 11th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. And as you can imagine, we need lots of volunteers. If you would like to serve in any capacity at our VBS Blitz, find Hannah today to find out how to get signed up and where you can serve. Third time's the charm. West Hampton is finally coming to Gray on August 7th, and we promise not to reschedule it again. Tickets are only $10 in advance and can be purchased through Realm. West has been singing with the Gaither Vocal Band for 15 years and has seen much success in his ministry. Get your tickets now on our website by going to the Events tab and registering in Realm. Don't forget about our Great Commission offering. This is an offering that is aside from usual tithes and offerings received each week and goes to support missions both here at home and abroad. Local ministries that benefit from the GCO are Sunrise Ministries and the Branch Church. The IMB and North American Mission Board also benefit from the Great Commission offering. So we encourage families to make a point to give to the Great Commission offering so that we can help people from all over the place find Jesus and give Jesus away. For a complete list of events and what's going on, visit our website at fbcgray.org and go to the events page. Thank you for joining us today. Now, let's worship the Lord together. Good morning, First Baptist. If you're wondering, it actually is Father's Day again. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, we're going to do, we got a lot of things going on this morning. We got baptism communion, but I want to take it just a second and talk about camp from a couple weeks ago. Um, we had a great time, and some of y'all gave money to that, and I want you to hear kind of what and how we saw the Lord move last a couple weeks ago. So I'm going to read a couple things from some of our students, okay? So the first one is from Ansley Ard. This past week at camp, I found nightlife very moving. I feel like the Lord was really moving us to grow closer to one another, and we, we knew we weren't alone when we were sharing our struggles. I also saw him move when seven, no, actually just six, it's one another rededication, kids from our church decided to get saved. The next one is from Kai Anderson. I saw the Lord move in many ways, one of them being in which he really opened my eyes, and I truly felt he forgave me when I truly repented. I felt the Lord move when I was praying over Dorian, and everyone else joined in, and that's when I felt him the strongest. This next one is from Chloe Clark. I saw the Lord move this week by opening up conversations about the gospel with, with the babies at our site, our site babies as we call them. I've been praying for him to open one of these up, and he opened up just a couple of them. This last one is from Jesse Taylor. How I saw the Lord move at camp is the bond of our youth group grow, seeing the vulnerability of each, of each other, especially after nightlife, seeing how we all connected and we were there for each other, and seeing our different connections with different people throughout the week, week was really cool to me. It didn't matter what you're inter interested in or in what your interests were or how different you were from a person. We were still there for each other and connected simply to the fact that we are all broken and we all need God. So seeing how the whole youth group connected and how we all were all there for each other, even when it wasn't like our normal clicks or anything, especially after nightlife, was probably my favorite way I saw the Lord move. And so camp, we do have a lot of fun, but the whole goal of camp is that when we go, we know the Lord more. And so I want to say thank you all for letting us go and just, you know, giving to student ministry. We love y'all. And so now we're going to enter into a time of worship. So let me pray for us. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for waking us up and letting us come here and worship you. Lord, throughout this whole service, through baptism and remembering you in communion, that we would know you deeper. 
So, Lord, we ask these things in your name so that we know you hear us. Amen. It's a good morning to be at First Baptist, but it's especially a good morning anytime we do a baptism. This morning, Mr. Harrison Page has trusted Jesus as his Savior and is here to be baptized. Harrison, do you believe that Jesus has saved you from your sins? Yes, sir. And he's your Lord and Savior. All righty. Harrison Page, in obedience to the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ and upon your profession of faith in him, I do baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There you go, buddy. Good morning. Would you stand together? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. God's word is revealed to us and we respond to Him in worship. Let's join our voices and our hearts together to sing. Come, let us worship my King. has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things.
cross I cannot comprehend the agonies of Calvary you the perfect holy one crushed your son and drank the bitter cup reserved for me Satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Want your enemy now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. that uh, has been on my mind for a little while is that we have not had a pastoral prayer in the service, which, eh, you know, maybe, maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't, but the Lord kept bringing this to my mind, so we're going to do it. 
and uh, we'll find out if that's what he wanted or not. The purpose behind that is we'll read scripture and then we're going to pray the scripture. And it's a time for us as a body to join our hearts together to pray the Lord's words back to him. So see where we go. Psalm chapter 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let's pray together. Lord, of all the voices that we want to hear in all of creation, we want to hear yours. As much as we miss and yearn to hear mothers and fathers and children who have passed, we yearn to hear your voice more. Only you, Lord, are truth and righteousness and love and honor and nobility and kindness. Only you, Lord, are our salvation. We want to be blessed, Lord, so keep us safe from the counsel of the wicked. Help us to discern who will give us sinful guidance. Keep us from ever allowing anyone who scoffs at your name to think that we have any part in what they say about you. Keep us pure in your eyes. You are our delight. Your word frees us and restrains us and guides us and overwhelms us. We yearn to hear from you. Help us to yearn even more. We want to be like trees that are constantly refreshed and never stop bearing fruit so all of our friends, our families, our coworkers, Lord, strangers who simply strike up a conversation with us will hear and know and smell the smell of Jesus on our clothes. Our hearts break for the wicked because before you, they will fall. They don't know your mysteries and your wonders and their lives are like chaff. One day this husk of a body will fall off and they'll be blown away into everlasting darkness. They will perish a million times over. And Father, you know we're so weak. We moan when we're hot. We complain when we're cold. We grumble when we don't sleep well. We act like children sometimes when our food isn't served at the right temperature. You know how easily we're led astray. Bless us, Father, by going before us and behind us and beside us and around us, showing us the way to walk in it because we can't do it on our own. Blessed is your word. It is sweet on our lips. Thank you for your assurance of our salvation. Thank you for Harrison and for the assurance of his salvation and for his mom and dad and his grandparents and everyone who's touched that young man's life. Hold us close, Father. We ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, for this is according to your word, it's in your will. We know that you'll answer our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.
of Revelation. Then I looked, and behold, on the Mount of Zion stood the Lamb, and with the 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of the harpists playing on their harps. 
And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the four elders. No one could learn the new song except the 144 who had been redeemed from the earth. It was, it is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they were virgins. It is these who also, who the lamb, who followed the lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the lamb, and in their mouth was no lie found for they are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to, to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of passion of her sexual immorality. Another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength in the cup of his anger and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, and that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him. Who sat on the cloud, put your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, and the harvest for the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple of heaven, and he had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out, and from the altar the angel who has authority over, over fire, and who called with a loud voice to the one who had a sharp sickle. Put your sickle and gather your clusters of, from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the wine press as a high horse's bridle for six one hundred. Excuse me, 1,600 stadia. You know, we're, we are dangerous when we're tired. We're dangerous to ourselves. We're dangerous to everybody around us, really, when we're tired. I listened to a sermon that Charles Stanley did a long time ago. I don't know where it came from in Scripture. It had a very good psychological uh, uh, idea behind it. He warned his congregation to be very careful, to be very careful about making decisions, be very careful about temptation when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Tired's a problem. In this scripture, Jesus is addressing tired. He has a message for tired Christians in here in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation. He says, I know you're tired. I know you're tired. I know some of you are ready to give up, but don't. It's almost over. I know, I know how hard you are working. I know how hard it is for you. Don't stop. It's almost time to rest, he says. We're going to look at the four sections of these passages real quick today. If you're a note taker, put it into overdrive. 
We look at the church, we'll see the Father give the world one last chance, we'll hear Jesus encourage Christians, and finally we'll see the end result of everybody's choices. Chapter 13 ends pretty bad, actually, the way it feels. Satan, the Antichrist, false prophets are there. They're wielding raw, unrestrained, savage, totalitarian power over the entire earth. Their threat to whole humanity. You can worship the beast or not. You can get the mark or not. But if you don't get the beast, if you don't get the mark, we will cancel you, we will rob you, we will starve you, we will hope that you die. You can smell hate and smell the stench of death all over the end of chapter 13. But chapter 14 changes, just boom, just like that. John looks up. He looks up and sees the holy gathering place. He sees Mount Zion and Jesus is standing there, but he's not standing by himself. He's surrounded by the church. And see, this, this is where Revelation really starts getting very, very interesting for us. The church, every follower of every age, all throughout time, they are all there. And if they are all there and it is every follower all throughout time, you are there. I'm your fortune teller this morning. I'm the one that's going to tell you what your future includes. Your future, if you are a Christ follower, includes this moment. John looks up. He sees all of these people surrounding Jesus. They've got the mark of Jesus on their forehead. They see Jesus' name. They see Yahweh's name. Our hair is pulled back. Some of us don't have to worry. Your hair is permanently pulled back. Your hair is pulled back. He sees the mark right here on his forehead. Everybody's there. And we're singing. And we got to get rid of the coat this morning. I'm sorry. I'm just miserable. This ain't going to work. We've, we, we're singing. We're all in this job. Gig- here, hold that. We're all in this gigantic group around Jesus and we're singing and it's not an old hymn. I know some of our old folks have got to have an old hymn. It's not an old hymn. Young people, it's not the latest contemporary Christian song that you hear on the radio. It's a song that nobody else can sing. The only people that can sing this song are Christ followers. It's our song. It's the soundtrack to our victory dance and we are all standing there singing. I went to the Promise Keepers event back in uh, a billion years ago in Atlanta at the uh, Georgia Dome. 50,000 men singing Amazing Grace together. It was a dynamite moment. Nothing, nothing like what this is going to be. I looked up stadiums. I think the largest, one of the largest stadiums in the United States is Nyland Stadium in Tennessee where the Tennessee Volunteers lose regularly, but every now and then they win. And when they do win, they sing Rocky Top at the top of their lungs. 102,455 people singing Rocky Top. Can you imagine what that would sound like? And yet this is even bigger. This is even more. It's louder than anything you've ever heard. Jesus is singing there with us and we're singing this victory song to the Father. And in my mind, I imagine this picture. I know I did it when I was little. I can remember the embarrassing moment in my life when I did this. I imagine every one of us have done this at some point where you turn to your mom or your dad, your aunt, uncle, grandma, grandpa, whoever's raising you and you turn to them and you say, listen to me, listen to my song, listen to my song and you sing to them. And that's what's going on here is all of the father's children are going, daddy, listen to us, listen to the song, listen to this, listen how good this is. It's a tremendous moment. John says four things about the people that are gathered around Jesus. He says that we are chaste, C-H-A-S-T-E, not chaste, C-H-A-S-E-D, but chaste. That means that, that we're pure. It's going to make more sense as we read the rest of the letter. But there's this evil woman by the name of Babylon. She is the most vile, evil, disgusting, immoral woman to ever live. She represents to John, for John in his era, the Roman government. She represents to us in every age since John the governments that are being used by Satan to institute his diabolical, his deceiving work on this earth. And those around Jesus are virgins. They have not defiled themselves by worshiping that satanic agenda. 
They've not become a part of that. They worship the Lord and the Lord alone. He says that, excuse me, we follow the Lord wherever he goes. Guys, that's the stuff and substance of being saved. If, if you don't get any message in all the years that I preach here, get that message. If you joined the church at Vacation Bible School when you were six years old, you live like hell the rest of your life, and it comes to your death, and you start telling me that you're, you're, you've been saved a long time ago, I've got to worry about your eternal destination. Because the stuff and substance of being saved is the old hymn, wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll go wherever he wants me to because I know he's the boss. He's got it right. He's doing the right thing. That's what I've got to do. Third, we're first fruits. First fruit is the holy harvest. Everybody else is left out of it. We are the ones who are dedicated to the Lord. And finally, we're blameless. And this is my favorite one. I hope you know what I'm going to say even before I say it here. There is nobody in this room who is blameless. But when you are washed by the blood of the lamb, you are blameless. And I know it's kind of, you know, this is older music, I suppose. Mercy Me's flawless song. I love it. I posted it on Facebook this week for y'all to go listen to before you came here today because I'm quoting from it. I would sing it for you, but you know how that rolls. Could it possibly be that we simply can't believe that this unconditional kind of love would be enough to take a filthy wretch like this and wrap him up in righteousness. And that's exactly what he did. It's exactly what he did. So take a breath, smile, and say, right here, right now, I'm okay because the cross was enough. Do you understand? Some of y'all got to smile. Y'all look like y'all need to go to the bathroom. Wake up for just a minute. Come on. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do, I, do you hear, do you understand what I'm saying to you this morning? That you know who you are. You know where you've been. You know what you've said. You know what you've done. You know things that nobody else in the world knows about you. And when you stand before the Lord, you know you stand before the Lord guilty. And he says, let me tell you something. You are covered by the blood of my son. You are blameless. You are flawless. You are perfect in my sight. I want you with me. It don't get any better than that. We are singing in this crowd. We are all four of these things because our big brother Jesus, though the world was against him, he made up his mind once and for all to end our rejection. He walked valiantly, faced his accusers. Jesus was never on the defensive. He was always on the offense. He accepted their punishment. He died during the battle. But on the third day, the father ended that, reached into death, gave Jesus new life so that every man, woman, and child alive who would believe in Jesus, who would repent of their past and make up their minds once and for all to follow Jesus, that one day they'll all be gathered on Mount Zion around Jesus, singing the victory song, a bunch of warriors that have fought through this life, through the hardship of this life, singing, we have won because of Jesus. I'm telling you, don't get better. I want you to join me. If you've never trusted Jesus, if you've never repented of your past and made your mind up to follow Jesus, you need to do it now. We want you to join us. We want you at this celebration in Revelation 14 in a choir of folks that are singing so loud that it sounds like Niagara Falls. Don't, don't miss this. God doesn't want you to miss this. We've been going through Revelation for an awful long time and you know in Revelation it's getting worse and worse and worse. We're down to 14. Chapter 14, there's 22 chapters total. We're coming to the end of this thing. And it's starting to look really, really bad for the folks that aren't Christ followers. But in God's compassion, he offers the world one more chance. He sends three angels. They fly directly overhead of every nation, every tribe, every language, every people. And they broadcast to all of these people the eternal gospel. It'll never change. It can't be added to. It can't be taken away from. And this first angel, he admonishes everybody on the world... Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and springs of water. Notice in this, guys, pay attention when you're reading the scripture and understand what you're reading. The tone changes here. 
You don't hear in this scripture, come to me you who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. What you hear in this is, this is your last chance. This is your last chance. You know everything I've said up until this point. This is the last chance. And then he goes on and says, Babylon has fallen. If you're following the governmental systems of this world, if you're following Satan's deception and you're part of that, I need you to understand, he's saying, that that's fallen. It's gone. It's going by the wayside. Babylon represents all of the systems of the world that Satan uses to deceive you and destroy you. And her influence is so wide that she makes all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Now, there's something hidden in the original language here, kind of gets missed in our translation. It's translated properly. I'm not saying it's not translated properly. It's the way that John uses the words here. You see, this word passion is translated differently in verse 10 and verse 19. It's the same word. In this, in this verse, it's passion, and in 10 and 19, it's the word wrath. The word wrath. The warning is loud and clear here. If you participate in the passion of her sexual immorality, you will also participate in the wrath that her immorality will bring. If you go along with her, you will get what she gets. She is destroyed. She has fallen. If you are wise, you will repent and follow Jesus. If you are not wise, you will follow her. You will be fallen and you will be destroyed too. That's what he's saying. But God knows our hearts. And he knows that more people are going to follow Babylon than are going to follow him. He knows more people are going to take the mark of the beast. And to those who take the mark of the beast, who worship the comforts and power and acceptance of this world, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger. You don't want to drink that cup. You can't bear to drink that cup. You may be the baddest of the bad, but you can't handle that. When God pours out his wrath, it's going to be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Fire, sulfur, torment forever and ever. And your suffering will be on full display for the angels and for Jesus to see. We won't be able to see it. But it says that, that Jesus can see your suffering. And the angels can see your suffering. You will not be able to hide in shame. That little secret that you hide from everybody will be exposed to the world. You'll be tormented forever and ever in full view of Jesus and the angels. There'll never be a moment from now on that you will have a moment's rest. Never have a moment's rest. He says they have no rest day and night. No rest day and night. You'll be troubled forever. There's still time to repent, he says. Till still time to be saved. But time's running out. And when it does, you can't imagine how hideous your eternal existence is going to be. It's time to repent. It's time to make up your mind to follow Jesus. You know it's the right thing you to do. You can hear him calling out to you. So this morning, we're going to do something really kind of different. In the middle of the sermon, we're going to stop and we're going to have an invitation. Right this minute, we're going to sing. And I'm inviting you. This isn't going to be a head bowed and eyes closed kind of thing. This is going to be a di little bit different. Because I want us to, to know. Nobody who loves Jesus wants to see anybody suffer through that. And as, as lousy as we are at it, Jesus' way is the best way. We, Christ followers, want you to follow Jesus. You might look around yourself, and you might know us really, really well, and you might say, you know what, you're not all that much. And I'll agree with you, we're not all that much. We're Baptist. We like to fight. We like to disagree. We like to be ornery. We do like to have covered dish dinners. That's our one redeeming value. But other than that, we know how to argue. But that's okay. Because we have Jesus and he's helping us to get over it. That's all we need. So I'm not asking you this morning, every eye bowed and every head bowed and every eye closed. We're going to do what they did at student camp this year. 
It's time for you to decide whose team you're on. Make up your mind right now. Some of you aren't scared of anything in the world except this one thing. Coming in front of folks, saying that you're going to follow Jesus for the rest of your life. It terrifies you. But you're going to get called on one day to make a stand, whether you want to make it or not. Why not make it today on your terms? on the terms that the Lord is offering you this morning and not somebody else's. Listen, you're never going to be in a crowd of people who encourage you more. And I'm going to ask y'all to prove it to people who don't trust Jesus as their Savior. We don't want to see anybody go to hell. Listen, I know I don't have time, but let me just throw this out at you right now. There are some people in this world I have confessed to you before that I do not like. No, they're not in this church. I love everybody in this church. But there are some people outside this church that I can't stand. I don't want to see them go to hell. I know that you've got people in your life that you would just, just, if I never see them again, that's a day too soon. But you don't want to see them in hell, do you? Of course you don't. You want us all to be singing. So to show support this morning, I know it's crazy. I mean, this is kind of a Elevation Church kind of thing to do, maybe. If you would love to see everybody in here that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior to be saved this morning, would you applaud and show them some encouragement that we want you, we want you, we want you to know Jesus. We want you to know Jesus. We want you to. All right, let's, we're going to sing a couple of verses of just as I am, and then we're going to get going again. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior this morning, come down and t- stand up and make a stand. You've got to. It's going to be now or it's going to be later, but it's going to happen. Do it this morning. Y'all come on. Stand up, everybody. Just as I Revelation chapter 14, verses 12 through 13. We're going to fly through the rest of this. Uh, Just want you to know, guys, that you'll never be on a better home court advantage than you are in church when you want to follow Jesus because there are people here that love you and want to see that happen. We're here. If you want to talk to me, Logan, Austin, Laura Lee, Chuck, you name it, there's people all over the sanctuary. Chris Towers, we're more than happy to talk to you about being a Christian. So you make it up, do it. Here's a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. If we look carefully here, we'll see both a warning and a promise. You see the word endurance. 
We've said before, you don't endure something fun. You don't endure something fun. Nobody ever says, we're having such a wonderful vacation. I really wish we could go home today, but we're just going to have to gut it out until Sunday because we're going to be here all week long. Nobody says that. You don't endure easy. You don't endure fun. You endure hard. And when something is hard for a long, long time, you get very tired of enduring. Don't you? How many, of you, how many of you are enduring right now? How many of you are going through hard things right now and you're tired and wish it was over? And yet it's not. Why did John tell us about what would happen to those who worship the beast before he told us to endure? Because he, he knew that persecution was wearing people down. And he knew that some of the people were ready to give up. But if you give up, then you join the other team. And if you join the other team, then you know how things are going to end. And some of you are saying, Randy, that's not very Baptist. You know, once saved, always saved. You can't lose your salvation. And my reply to you is this. If you can give up, were you on the team in the first place? He's saying, don't give up. Take a deep breath. Remember Jesus, make up your mind like he made up his mind to endure to the bitter end because something is about to happen. The Spirit makes a promise that they may rest from their labors. The beast worshipers never rest. Christ worshipers will forever rest. Forever rest. Now we're going to linger here for just a few short minutes. What does it mean to rest? What does it mean to rest? We're all thinking rest, we think vacation. What does rest mean? Well, in the context of persecution, it means you ain't got to worry about that anymore. You don't have to worry about somebody, you know, is today the day I get caught? Is today the day that I'm on the conference call and they call and ask me the question that I cannot with good conscience say, well, yeah, I agree totally that that's the way things are supposed to be. You don't worry about those things anymore. But there's more to it than that. Rest is a gift from God. If you're writing stuff down, there's one of them. Rest is a gift from God. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, Jesus says. It's a gift. So what is this gift? Rest means, here we go, we're going fast. Rest means that you don't have to watch your back anymore. 1 Kings 5, 4 says, but now the Lord... The Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There's neither adversary nor misfortune. You're not worried about it anymore. I don't know about y'all, but I've been in more places than you can count that I had to watch every word I said because I knew somebody was listening to me and they would misunderstand or misunderstand on purpose. Never have to do that anymore. There's no gonna, not going to be anybody out to get you. Rest means that you get along with people. Hebrews 12 says, strive for peace with everyone, for the holiness and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You get along with people. Rest means that you don't have to be afraid anymore. Lord, help. That's, this is one of the things that, that kills me when I watch folks that are terrified to do anything in this life. Rest means that you're not terrified anymore. But they shall sit, every man, under his vine and under his fig tree. And no one shall make them afraid for the mouth of the Lord of the host, the Lord of hosts has spoken. The very one who created the worlds and created everything that contains the world has turned right around and said, right here, no one shall make my people afraid ever again. Man, that's worth its weight in salvation right there. Throw the rest of them away. I like that one. Nobody's going to be on my back anymore. Nobody's going to make me afraid. I'm not going to be afraid of my job. I'm not going to be afraid of my life. I'm not going to be afraid of anything because the Lord said I'm not going to be afraid. Rest means that you don't worry about anything. Matthew 6, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Rest means that you always hear the voice of Jesus. And this is coming up for us. Revelation 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Jesus wants us to have this now. We have it now in bits and pieces. The older we get, the closer we draw to Jesus, the more we live in his rest. But one day we're going to go home. You all know, I know life is a one-to-one proposition. Nobody that comes into this thing gets out of it alive. 
He says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. That from now on is just a figure of speech. He means that blessed are the people who die in the Lord. Blessed indeed that they may have rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. Jesus is going to remember how hard you struggled. Listen, you're not going through the pain that you're going through for nothing. Your pain is not in vain. Your suffering is not in vain. John Piper has a great, if you've not heard his sermon on that, it's a dynamite sermon. This is not for nothing that you're doing this. Jesus sees you. He sees how hard you try. He knows how tired you are. He knows how disappointed you are when you do the wrong thing and you try to pick yourself up and you pull yourself together and dust yourself off. And Jesus intervenes and he helps us and he sees how we persevere with his help and he's going to be glad when we're home and I, he will remember our struggles. He sees it. It's not for nothing. The final seven verses here flashes back to Daniel chapter 7. Riding on the clouds, one like the Son of Man. It's the end. Jesus is not coming contrary to what people are wanting to say around the world. Jesus isn't coming in love, love, love to gather up everybody who says love is love and those who don't get loved and those who love too much and those who can't understand love. I'm going to come and bring you all together and teach you what love. He's not doing that. He's carrying a sickle. He's coming to harvest. It's a sharp blade to harvest grain. He swings it once and all of the saved are reaped. The fields are white with harvest. Do you remember Jesus saying that? Last soul has been saved. The last martyr has been martyred. Jesus calls all of his children home. This is the rapture in whatever form that might take. He brings them all home. Then he swings again. When he swings again, he harvests grapes that are thrown into the wine press of the wrath of God. The grapes are stomped on so their juice could be collected and the blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. That's 184 miles, which exactly corresponds to the length of the promised land. The blood's going to cover the entire Palestinian area is what he's saying. Do I believe this is literal? No, I don't believe it's literal. Most of the numbers in Revelation aren't literal numbers. They're there for effect to make you think about something. So what does this make us think about? I went to Google, who knows everything, and I asked Google, how many people have ever lived on the face of this earth? And Google had an answer. Google said that as of 2020, since creation to 2020, 116,761,402,000 people, they had it down to a person, have lived on this earth. If you take people at their word, which is a dangerous thing, 31% of those people were Christian. They won't text God's wrath. 31%. But the remaining 80,436,930 do that again, 80,436,930,022 people thrown into the wine press. How much blood would flow with 80 billion people dying? But see, there's a contrast. 80 billion people, but there was this one guy that died on a cross. His body contained about 1.5 gallons of blood. And that little bit of blood that dripped onto the ground outside of Jerusalem about 2,000 years ago was enough to save all 116 billion had they followed Jesus. They didn't all. And his blood didn't cover them all. Because they will taste the cup of the wrath of God. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus himself said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should not lose that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. 
For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on that last day, and we will be standing together with him, singing. And some of y'all who can't sing will sound good that day. Brothers and sisters, I invite you this morning to join me at the table so that we can remember that we will never hunger and we will never thirst because of a man who made up his mind to do what it took to save you and me. We remember the story said, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after, bless, after blessing it, he broke, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Just think, one day we'll eat at Jesus' table. It's not going to be a little flannel graph table that you saw in VBS at some point in your life, a real table. He'll be there. Think about this. Guys, we made it so serious in the church and so somber. I want you to think about this. We're going to sit at Jesus' table. We're going to sing. We're going to laugh. We're going to rest because of what Jesus did. In a moment, if you would, those of you who are on the right-hand side of the sanctuary, my left, ask you to exit that way and come down to Austin. For those of you on this side, exit this way, come around and come down to me. When you get through taking communion, if you would go back to your seats, we're going to sing a song before we go. So if y'all would stand, Austin's going to lead us in a word of prayer. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for you. Thank you that you are holy, that you saved us. You stepped off the throne in the time and rescued us. Lord, thank you for your table and that we're going to eat with you one day. Lord, be with us in this time as we remember what you did on the cross for us. That you took our place and died the death that we deserved. So Lord, thank you for all that you do and all that you are. So we ask these things in your name so that we know you hear us. Amen.
so as we have uh, collectively partaken of the body and the blood of Christ, we die with him. And through his resurrection and our faith and trust in him, we experience his resurrection. So today, we're going to leave this room singing in the victory because of the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection that he gives us. So let's stand together, and we're going to sing the second verse in the chorus of Great Thing.